The thing is, you should ask for reassurance whenever you want to fucking ask for reassurance. However, I do understand that, like, when you're first starting to see someone and you're first dating somebody, you're probably not wanting to, like, overload them. You sort of have to accept that there's a certain amount of uncertainty that's going to be present when you first start dating somebody. And whenever people say, like, how soon is too soon to ask for reassurance, it seems like they're saying, like, I feel like I'm really overwhelming and my needs is going to be too much for somebody. So you're already feeling like you're not being authentic. Well, this has been a long time in my dreams. It had, you probably didn't know about me, but I was like, you know, kind of secretly stalking you. Uh, Therapy Jeff, as you're so well known, uh, welcome to the podcast. Yeah, I'm really excited to be here, and I'm happy that you reached out. Yeah, I, I wasn't super aware of you, and I, I did see you on Instagram every now and then, uh, which was really exciting. So when you reached out officially, I was super stoked to be here. Well, you know, the sign of a good stalker is n- someone not knowing they're doing it. I wouldn't be good, <laughs> good at it if you're like, yeah, you've been creeping on my shit for a long time. Yeah, you did well then. Good job. Yeah, I did well. I did well. Yeah. Gold star. Well... <laughs> I'm pumped to have you here. I mean, I've been watching you distill information and break down people's dating, relating, all those types of experiences in such a consumable. Like, I'm like, how did he do that in one minute? And, and I'm sure that is, uh, you know, what what has really brought you so much success because you're able to bring these com- what feels like very complex relational challenges into simple step by step consumable pieces. And you know, I'm curious. What got you started? Because you're like a TikTok superstar. <laughs> and, you know, I watch you on Instagram too. And, and mm-hmm. I'm curious, yeah, what what got you into it? How did you end up in the online space? Yeah, I mean, I've been a therapist for almost 20 years now. So I've been doing this for a while. And I've been mostly seeing, I started out seeing like families uh, and kids uh, it turned out that I, I couldn't continue seeing families for a while because I just like I fucking hated the parents. I would get so <laughs> mad at the parents. And it was all my bullshit that was like coming up. The parents were fine. They weren't fine, actually. They're turds. But <laughs> it was, I, I like as a therapist, you need to be compassionate, even if like the parent is no good. Um, so I quickly pivoted onto young adults and young couples, couples mostly that were like couples that are in love. And that's who I still see. I see couples that are still in love and not the couples that have been together forever and haven't had sex and haven't talked to each other for five years. And it's just like bad fucking energy. There's a bunch of other therapists that are into that shit. I'm not. I want like the love. I want the fun fights. I want like the excitement. That's what I'm looking for. And so I sort of like pivoted into all of that stuff. And I've just had my private practice for, like I said, almost 20 years. Um, and through that, as you like, as you're a therapist or if you're a coach working with people, like you start to get these like one liners of just shit that you say over and over and over again. And at the beginning or right before the pandemic hit, I just started to get really into TikTok and zone out on it and have a lot of fun just watching it. And then pandemic struck and I got really lazy. Where I was just like, I don't feel like doing any extra work. I'm just going to like sit on my couch as much as I can and keep on scrolling through TikTok. And after a, a year of doing that, I was like, I get it. I was like, I know how to blow up. I can fucking do this. And a lot of people that interview me are like, oh, I bet you weren't planning to get a million followers. I was like, I was for sure planning. You're like a hundred. If you yeah. saw my vision board, it says... <laughs> A million exactly. fuckers uh-huh. they were doing this. <laughs> uh, and so I was like, this is easy. I can do this because I have like a ton of one-liners that I like preach while I'm doing therapy. And I know how to do the hook. And with TikTok, it's like you need a hook. And the, the first thing you say has to like really hook you in. And then I talk extremely fast usually to get it under one minute. That's my goal. And like you said... I've always been really good at taking complicated information and distilling it into like really bite-sized, concise information, because that's the only way that I can understand things. Yeah. Um, so so that's how I got into it. I had a goal, a goal to get over a million followers. I bashed through that goal. I'm very happy with it. And I don't know. And now I'm here on your podcast, Dream Come True. Yeah, man. I mean, that's so cool to think. You know, when I started my Instagram, I wasn't thinking at the time I actually didn't really know how to use it and it was new mm-hmm. and it was like a photography app, right. you know, and I look at Instagram and I'm, or sorry, at TikTok 
And I'm like, this is really the future of how people consume information. You know, this is mm -hmm. these, you know, whether it's our attention span, I think our attention spans are both a product of the the world today, but also mm -hmm. the way that media is constructed. So it's like mm -hmm. one feeds the other. Mm -hmm. um, but we do want actionable things quickly. Like we want to solve things quickly. And who wouldn't want to solve a relational challenge quickly? Like who wouldn't <laughs> want five ways to do this or six, exactly. you know, like it, it just makes sense. Yeah, it makes sense. And and a lot of the stuff that I'm saying is like, you'll watch it and you'll be like, oh, that's that's pretty basic. Um, but we need to do the basics. And a lot of people don't understand the basics. And sometimes the way I phrase it and deliver it, it can like resonate with you in a way that maybe it hasn't resonated before, or it can create like even like deeper, richer conversations. Um, but it's it the, the stuff that I'm saying isn't mind blowing. I don't think. I just think that I like deliver it in a nice nice little package to receive it. Well, I think it is. You know, it depends on oh. the person's, I guess, relational awareness <laughs> and uh -huh. and everyone's on the journey and adding it to the skills and toolbox. I'm I'm curious, what is like the majority of your audience? Are they mainly people who are dating or in that sort of young uh, love marriage space? I, it sounds mm -hmm. like they're either trying to catch the honeymoon or on the honeymoon or falling from the grace of falling from grace from the honeymoon. A lot of that. I mean, if I look at my stats on like Instagram and, and TikTok, close to 90% of my audience are women. Yeah. So that's predictable and sad. Um, yeah, it is. And I maybe have the same. kind of, yeah, maybe sort of interesting, but uh, and yeah, and then they, especially on TikTok, they skew younger, more like Gen Z and younger millennials, uh, but really, you know, it covers the whole age span. And a lot of people are feeling just sort of like helpless, powerless, upset with like, why do I keep on experiencing the same bullshit, the same like relationship patterns over and over again? Like, how can I get past it? How can I get through it? And every now and then I'll talk about family and blame your parents. Because we know I hate parents. Uh, I just I just own that shit. I don't care. I'll blame your parents for everything or caregivers. It's fine. And those typically do pretty well, too, because it's sort of like, oh, this is why I am who I am. Mm. And yeah, we're blaming your your parents. But we're also I'm trying to encourage you. But like now that's yours. And right. what are you going to do about it? And how do you not pass it on to your kids if you want to have kids? I like the realism of that. Of Like, yes, mm -hmm. actually blame them because they gave you this pattern. Mm -hmm. And now you got to do something with it, though. Yeah. And if you want, you can be compassionate and blame your parents' parents and their parents' parents' parents. It can be a whole intergenerational thing. Go ahead and have compassion for your parents or fucking hate them. I don't care. I'm focused on you and how they affected you. And sometimes there's always that question. I don't know where you land on this, but like, do you need to forgive somebody? Do you need to forgive your parents in order to heal? Um, and uh, there's, I've seen so many people fall on like, uh, all the different sides on that question. I'm mostly like, no, you don't have to, you don't have to forgive someone in order to heal me. Actually, me and Taylor Swift think the exact same way. We're basically twins. <laughs> uh, <laughs> she feels that way too. You can just sort write of, like, a song about it for sure. Uh, I, yeah, and I think that her songs are mostly inspired by my content, even though she doesn't follow me and doesn't comment on that. But I, I'm, <laughs> I feel like energetically we're somehow connected, and uh, and I love that for her. Um, but uh, <laughs> there's so sometimes people are like, don't you, don't you have to forgive your parents? And if you're going to forgive your parents, like forgive them for yourself, like almost like mm. be selfish about it, like forgive them so you can like let go of that anger or resentment or contempt or whatever it is in order to like heal and move forward. It's good for them too, I guess, you know, they get to like have somebody to forgive them. I don't know. How do you feel about that? Do you feel like you need, you have to forgive someone? You know, that's a great question. I think I agree with you that no, you don't have to. Um, I think it's there's a saying that forgiveness is letting go of all hope for a better past. Mm -hmm. And I think maybe it's about um, not holding on to wishing for a different story. And then you're able to accept the story that was, I really think forgiveness comes from actually transforming from the experience. Mm -hmm. Like if I often ask people, what is not forgiving holding you back from doing? Mm -hmm. And you got to go do those things. If you go do those things, then you're you're now free. Because I, you know, mm -hmm. I'm sure you experienced this too. But you know, I'll talk with someone who's 
saying like, well, look how bad they broke my heart. Like I've never, I'm never loving again. And I'm like, oh, way to stick it to them. Like you never get to have a relationship again. And meanwhile, they're eating bonbons, posting pictures with their new partner or their old partner or their kids or whatever it is Mm -hmm. that they've moved on from. They're not thinking about it. And we like almost want to prove how broken we are because of them. And Mm -hmm. I mean, that's a sad state to remain in. It doesn't mean we can't be in it after a breakup, but it's, we just don't want to end up in the prison of, of that space. Yeah, I agree. But there is like some, sometimes it feels satisfying to be like, look how much you hurt me. I am devastated. I'll never grow or, you know, date anybody again. Um, But, you know, like you're saying, like you're just hurting yourself. The other person probably is fine. They're going to be okay. They're going to move on. And you're choosing to not move on if you like stay in that state. And I get it. And maybe you're you're doing that because it actually worked when you were a kid. Maybe that's how you got attention. Maybe you had to do that in order to survive, to get your needs met, like to be incredibly dramatically sad or whatever it is. Um, So I understand, but it's probably not working for you anymore. And it is probably pretty unattractive as well. Like you're not going to attract other partners who are going to be like a really healthy match for you if that's what you end up doing, you know? Yeah. You're on a date talking about it. Oh my God. Yeah. I haven't been able to open my heart. And this person's like swipe left in real life. Like, can I just go home? You that know? is such that is such a red flag when somebody is just like talking shit about their ex and uh. how much they they're horrible or they're crazy or whatever it is. Like it's just it's not a good look. You don't we don't want to hear about that. There's 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 different ways to talk about your your exes in like really healthy, attractive ways. That's not the way to do it. And yeah, I totally agree. Because mm-hmm. the person on the other side is going, well, one day I might be your ex mm-hmm. and you're just going to talk shit about me. It just shows me that the person hasn't healed or hasn't let it go and, and maybe isn't ready for something new, which doesn't mean that someone can't have experienced betrayal and be upset about it. I'm curious, what are some ways that someone can speak or you know that it's sort of a green flag of how they're expressing about their ex? First, though, like you're saying, like, you may have come from a narcissistic, abusive relationship where it is 100% their fault. You should never be abused and that's fucked up. So like there are situations where it is 100% your ex's fault. But if you can talk about it in like a really nuanced way and take accountability for like what you did in order to like help cause the end of the relationship, then I'm like, those are green flags for me because like, you're seeing things with like your wise mind. You're not feeling triggered. You're not feeling activated. Like you're pointing out, it doesn't feel, you know, like if they are talking all this shit and they are really triggered, it doesn't feel like they're very healed. Instead, they're like seeing it from all these different perspectives and understanding that there's like still growth that they have to do on their end. And a really big green flag for me is that, you know, you have red flags. Mm, Tell me more about that. I think that a lot of people don't know what their red flags are. Uh, That their own, like theirs? Yeah, what their own red flags are. And I think a lot of it, I I think, didn't you say in one of your reels on Instagram or something, it might have been you, of like, we judge ourselves based on our intentions and we judge other people based on their actions or behavior. Did you say that? I didn't, but I like that. Somebody said it. Lay it down. Yeah. (laughs) And... And I, and I love it because like, we're just like, oh, we, I don't have any red flags because my intentions are pure and yeah. I'm, I'm just like the sweetest guy. I, and, and if I hurt you, like, obviously it's on accident and I don't have any ill will, but the way that you're coming off and the way you impact people is like, can be perceived by many people as a red flag. And if you don't know what those things are, then it's like, there's, you're lacking a certain amount of awareness that I think is crucial in a healthy relationship. So what do you think your red flags are? (laughs) Oh, that's such a good question. Because as you said it, I was like, huh, this is the act of humility. Okay, Mm -hmm. so a red flag, an area of development that I continue Mm -hmm. to have is I inherited, mom and dad, thanks, I inherited (laughs) defensiveness. Mm -hmm. And so I have to do, when I experience, I, I often interpret feedback through the lens of I'm not enough. Mm -hmm. And so then my nervous system gets dysregulated and my natural thing is to defend Mm -hmm. and or 
project. <laughs> and <laughs> I know one of the antidote, one of the antidotes to that is saying, I can see some truth in what you're saying. Uh, yeah. And that's like eating your own shoe. So I practice that one though. And I really practice seeing my partner through the lens of being an invitation to my evolution. Although sometimes I don't like the invitation and reject it for about an hour and a half. And then I come back. Sure. Um, yeah. You can say this now because that is the right thing to say and do. But like when you're in the middle of it, we like always sort of like revert back to these like old triggers and defense mechanisms and your red flags are showing when that happens. And for me, it's like, I am, I'm going to come at you. I'm going to be like, I'm going to prove to you that I'm right and you're wrong. Like, I'm just <laughs> like, I'm going to be like really black and white. And you know what? I'm a fucking relationship expert. I have 1.2 million followers on TikTok. You fucking idiot. Like, do you see the authority <laughs> yeah, that yeah, I yeah. have? Like, yeah. why aren't you respecting this? So I come off as like, I, I like to think that I'm like playfully narcissistic, but uh, <laughs> like we all have a little bit of narcissism in us yeah. and, we, and it's nice if you can kind of like own it and have levity about it. But the way I'm coming off to some people is just like, I'm being a big fucking asshole and I'm not leaving space for you to be right. I'm not allowing you to like positively influence me because I'm like, cool, I'm right and you're wrong. Let's fucking hear how wrong you are. And that's what I had to do in order to like survive my childhood because we all had to fight for who was right and who was going to get attention, who was going to get love. Mm. And you can go ahead and like, I'm compassionate to my own red flags, but not everybody else is going to be, and it's going to rub them around the wrong way. And we need to be aware of those things. Yeah. It's fascinating to think about you judge someone else based on their actions, but you look at yourself through your intentions. You know, mm -hmm. as I was sort of breaking down that language, I was thinking about, you're right. Like we give ourselves the benefit of the doubt, but mm -hmm. we don't do that with other people. And we assume that when something happens that hurts us, that it was ill intention. You know, I think one of the mm -hmm. things that Gottman's talk about is assuming good intent, mm -hmm. uh, which obviously you can't do with like a manipulative, abusive narcissist. Sure. Right. But for the most part, for most 99% of the population, Mm -hmm. um, or, you know, the majority of relationships, it's such a shift to move to assuming good intent, mm -hmm. you know, to like saying, oh, they were late. Um, and maybe it's because they were doing something that, you know, or they, they tried to get there in time or whatever it might be. Mm -hmm. or, I think the example I was thinking of that I just kind of messed up is someone's late all the time. And then when they get on time, we're like, oh, you just caught good traffic. <laughs> <laughs> like exactly. couldn't be in something else, uh -huh. you know? Yeah, there is. It's 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 so simple. It's so basic, but it's like incredibly powerful. And a lot of times when couples come in, they've for a long time, a, a, a good deal. They probably have like shifted into scanning for all the reasons that their partner is a fucking asshole. And they're no longer like going ahead and like pivoting into good intentions and mm. or, you know, uh, and there's only so long sometimes you can do that for because sometimes like if relationships are toxic and go on for a long time, there's just so much resentment and contempt built up that you can't just like easily pivot into like, oh, but their intentions are good. So you want to make sure that you're doing that early and often. And if you're not, then you're trying to like address the thing that's making it hard for you to do that. When couples come in and they have that deep level of contempt or build up, you know, I think about often when a couple is coming into a therapist or coach and they haven't seen one mm -hmm. and they're like taking notes on all the ways that the therapist is going to support them in how <laughs> wrong their partner is. I think what's <laughs> funny about that is you end up with a real come to Jesus experience, right. you know, where they're like, wait, what I'm, it's like when someone is in a relationship with an addict, they think the problem is always just the addict. Right. Exactly. But they're enabling them or they're caught in some sort of pattern where they're they're addicted to their addiction in some way or being needed or whatever it is. Like you're a part of that system. And so, yeah, all the time couples are coming in and, and their main agenda is like, I'm going to get Jeff to take my side. And inevitably, I'm going to disappoint both of them because I'm going to give that really cliche, stupid fucking therapist thing where I'm going to say like, I'm not taking your side or your side. I'm taking the side of the relationship. And I oh, roll my eyes zinger. while I'm saying it, but like that is exactly what I'm doing. Um, 
and and you're you're both going to be let down by what I'm doing here. Um, so yeah, so that's always a really fun journey to go on. I'm curious in the dating process. One thing that you talk about that I really wanted to explore on the podcast was. And I think we really struggle with this, especially when we're in that process of getting to know people. When can we begin to ask for our needs to be met? When can we um, know is the right time even to ask for reassurance about, you know, are we seeing other people, you know, all that kind of stuff. You know, I'm curious your thoughts on that. As you all know, I've had guests on the podcast exploring how to optimize the body, how to optimize the mind. I think about it in the context of my relationship to my performance and complimenting my body or empowering my body through really good sleep and looking at things like adaptogens and nootropics and that kind of stuff. Recently, I've become aware of a company called Cured Nutrition who I absolutely love. And there's a podcast episode with the founder named Joseph Sheehy, and he's an incredible guy. So I can't wait for you to hear the story of its birth. And one of my favorite products from them is a raw CBN nighttime oil. This oil has a three to one ratio of CBD to CBN, and it's just specially formulated to improve sleep quality and really promote that deep relaxation relaxation and a longer, more restful sleep. Now, each bottle contains 450 milligrams of full spectrum CBD, 150 milligrams of CBN, and natural terpenes that synergistically support relaxation, stress reduction, just improve sleep. And I gotta tell you, I absolutely love them. You just put one dropper full under your tongue 30 minutes before bed, and I've been feeling really deeply rested when I wake up. I'm getting some serious REM. My dreams are off the chain and I love it. And this company Cured, take a moment and really check out the episode that I did with the founder. This company Cured is perfectly in alignment with my values, the integrity I live by. I love the founder. I want you to check out that episode so you can learn a little more about them. And right now Cured is extending an exclusive offer to you, my listeners. You can grab the CBN night oil or anything else that they have for 20% off. Just go to www.curednutrition, so C U R E D nutrition.com slash create the love and use the coupon code create the love at checkout. So once again, that's C U R E D nutrition.com slash create the love. And again, use create the love, the coupon code at checkout to save 20%. The thing is that like my first, if I like have to just give like a one sentence answer, it's like, you should ask for reassurance whenever you want to fucking ask for reassurance, like right. just go for it. Um, however, I do understand that like when you're first starting to see someone and you're first dating somebody, you're probably not wanting to like overload them with everything. And there's, there's, you sort of have to accept that there's a certain amount of uncertainty that's going to be present when you first start dating somebody and that can cause a lot of anxiety or you can try to flip it and make it like you know instead of it feeling anxious you feel really excited like ooh, the anticipation i don't know what's going on here do they like me do i like them i don't know we're gonna like find out together sort of thing um but every now and then it gets to a place where it just feels a little overwhelming or you're getting like some sort of mixed message and whenever people say, like, how how soon is too soon to ask for reassurance, um, the question I feel like focuses on, like, you know, like, I, it seems like they're saying, like, I feel like I'm really overwhelming and my mm -hmm. needs and desires or want for, like, you know, safety is going to be too much for somebody. So you're already feeling like you're not being authentic because <laughs> like, like the uh, framing of the question yeah the framing of the question the way that you see yourself you, you see yourself as too much you see yourself as too needy as too clingy you feel like that's really unattractive so you're wanting to like hide this quote-unquote like unattractive side of you so I, I might just like my longer response is like why do you feel like you're too much for somebody like what's uh, where did you get that message from is it from your parents i hate your parents we know this but is it <laughs> is it from society okay. also hate society is it from your culture the world like tv hollywood instagram tiktok probably not my tiktok but everybody else's tiktok like this <laughs> is like i i understand that you know some bullshit the rules book that you fucking read in order to like play some gamey bullshit oh, yeah, the pickup artistry five ways to get 
get him to text you back <laughs> bullshit stuff. Exactly. So it's it feels like, you know, I'm not I'm not really liking where that question is coming from, but I'm going to be like sensitive to where you're at and I'm probably going to tell you to speak up and maybe even lean into like you can't ask the right person the wrong question sort of thing. So if it's like mm. if it is the right person and you ask for reassurance, they're probably going to be like, "Come here, babe." Like, or what right. do you need? So, and I know from my own personal dating experience, if somebody is asking me for reassurance I'm, and I really like them, I'm going to probably give it to them and even more. Like, I like to do that. That's like how I connect. If they're asking for reassurance and I don't want to give it to them, it might be because I'm not that into them. And I, and it's not that black and white. And I don't think that like you should just, that also kind of goes into the, have you heard, you know, what all the kids are talking about? Like, um, what is the saying? If they wanted to, they would. Have you heard that? No, is that like a, a TikTok sentence right now? It's a, it's a TikTok thing, yeah, yeah, where I'm like constantly asked, Jeff, what do you think about if they wanted to, they would? As in like, if they yeah. really liked you, they would clearly fucking show it. And if they wanted to be there, they would be there for you. Like, it's very black and white. It's very simple. It feels kind of nice to operate in that way, but it's obviously so much more gray, so much more nuanced. It's not actually that simple. Um but sometimes you want to operate in that way because you're just sort of like, I want to be safe and I want to be right. secure. And that feels good to me. And I don't want to ask for reassurance. I just want it to be offered to me. Okay, you right. can operate that way if you want to. Um, I would encourage you to speak up, though. Yeah, like I think of some of those memes that you'll see where it'll say, if they liked you, they would never talk to another woman yeah. or man. And you're like, yeah, yeah, oh, yeah. my God, this is such <laughs> bullshit. But I do hear the need to sort of get into the binary idea of if they, what is it? If they wanted to, they would. If they wanted to, they would. Mm -hmm. There is such a simple, that's kind of like that movie and book, you know, he's not that into you. It was so simple, you know, it's so simple. I think of how there's that colloquialism, uh, the colloquial idea of believe actions, not words. Mm -hmm. And I and I think like, what's so, is that the one or is it believe words over action? I can't remember. <laughs> but either way, exactly. whatever it is, yeah, yeah. it's wrong in my books because I think someone can say, I don't want a relationship and then treat you like their partner, but they actually don't want one. Right. And so I always think like if there's an inconsistency between actions and words, it's an orange flag. It's at least something mm -hmm. to get some inquiry. You know, when I first said to my now fiance on our like, I think we were like our fourth week of dating and we were actually in Oregon on the coast. And I remember saying to her, you know, she was more avoidant. I was formerly more anxious, um, more prone to that. Although I like to throw in a little avoidance just to keep things mixed yeah, up, mixed you know? Yeah, I get it, I get it. Yeah, uh -huh. yeah, that's what the books say. So yeah, hey. Yeah, throw them off a little. <laughs> yeah, like I like you. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I don't. <laughs> maybe, who knows? I'll just neg you. Isn't that what it's called? Exactly, neg you. yeah, yeah, that's so, right. I was saying to her, you know, I'm really enjoying getting to know you and, you know, I'd really like to sort of make this more official or, or like not see other people. I said, mm -hmm. <laughs> she's more avoidant. She was just like, Ugh. like she, <laughs> we were laying in a, uh, in a bed beside each other. And she, <laughs> if I wasn't like at that point, more emotionally regulated and, uh -huh. You know, still the anxiety was showing up because she was pausing. And, you know, the pause is like the nightmare to mm -hmm. the anxious person or anyone who's like, I'm too much. Right. Yeah. But I knew that regardless of her answer, I was showing up for myself. Mm -hmm. And so I was like walking through this process of being <laughs> of her being like, uh, 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 <laughs> and I was like, wow, every book, this isn't good. This pause. Yeah. And then, no. right. And then we like get to the place where she's like, yeah, but you know, mm -hmm. her previous relationship was a marriage and it ended mm -hmm. in divorce and it was mm -hmm. very painful. And, you know, I was conscious of that, mm -hmm. but had I not sort of, I think the, the sort of catch to all of that was that regardless of her answer, I was comfortable with how I was showing up that mm -hmm. if she wasn't a fit, if she wasn't ready at that point, if I was going to open my heart more, it required us not seeing other people. Right. And I was honoring that if that didn't work. I mean, I had a long trip home from Oregon if it didn't work, but, you know, yeah. arriving, listening to fucking Adele or whatever. 
<laughs> or Taylor Swift, probably. That would have given me. Taylor, yeah. I would have texted you, yo, can you hit me up with the best TT? TS? TS? Is that the right? Exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's what they're saying. And that's the thing is that, like, if you would, if you would follow, if you would have followed, followed something that's like really black and white, if they wanted to, they would, you might have bailed on your future fucking fiance. Right. Like, you know, like you would have been like, oh, God, I sensed some hesitancy here. They must not like me. Yeah, forget it. But like you're saying, it comes from past relationship traumas or devastations or sad or whatever it is. And so you have to kind of like hang out there. And so when you're asking for your needs to be met, whatever those needs might be, I want you to see it as like, that's really hot. That's really sexy. This is a sign of a good, healthy relationship when you're, when you're able to like put your shit out there, especially like you did it in that example. You're just like, I'm going to fucking put it out there. And I don't know what the response is going to be, but I'm going to be congruent with what I want and express it. And it seems like it paid off. So it worked. Good job. It worked. Locked it down. Uh-huh. Locked it down. <laughs> good job. Exploring that idea of, as you said, the question when is too soon is in, is sort of in, giving us the sense that the person identifies that there is a too soon mm-hmm. and that too soon is because they have needs that need to be met and they feel like those needs are maybe too much for a regular person, mm-hmm. which is really interesting. Do you think that comes from the messaging of, of more avoidant messaging in relationships that comes from movies and Mm-hmm. you know, all the types of things that makes us think that like playing it cool or like not having needs is somehow like super hot, which <laughs> I don't know how that's hot, but you know what I mean? <laughs> I mean, I don't know. I mean, I don't know, but I also understand that that's what Hollywood has done for like so long. I think maybe it's shifting. I don't know, but there is, and it's, it's also very American, uh, and, and like, and it, and it goes into like hyper or toxic individualism, where we feel like as lo- we don't, we shouldn't count on anybody. We should meet all of our own needs. And how nice would that be that you don't have to count on anybody because you shouldn't count on anybody. You can only count on yourself, sort of thing. And that I'll yeah. never get hurt, and I'll never have to like ask for support. And that sounds really great, just being my own person. But, but really, like that's not. That's not how it works. Um, yeah. And, and we learn through relationship, not just, not only relationship with ourselves. There's, and it also, it's like, if you're getting into like hyper individualism, it can go into like the me versus you kind of bullshit. And you're not thinking relationally. You're not thinking about how you're impacting um, you're the person that you're with or the community that you're around, you usually get into these fights of who's right and who's wrong when really it's about like, how can we like address the system, the thing that's going on. Um, but it does sound like, you know, for whatever reason, it sounds like some sexy thing that we don't have to like count on anybody. And I don't think that's true at all. Well, it's also setting up this idea, like for the person we're dating that mm-hmm. we are needless, mm-hmm. you know, that we don't need reassurance. I mean, mm-hmm. it's the, in the, pursuit of trying to appear needless we now create this facade Mm -hmm. they don't even really get to know the real us as you said it sounds inauthentic and Mm -hmm. i think that's one of the hardest parts about relating and dating and codependency is like we present ourselves one way but we're actually robbing the people we're in relationship with of ever really getting to know us and and we're also sending the message to ourselves that We're not worthy of being seen just through our own actions, which of course, you know, we sort of project onto them, Mm -hmm. you know, like it's not safe for me to speak. Meanwhile, I never give them the opportunity to actually Mm -hmm. hear me, which is Mm -hmm. a great world to live in because it's never my fault. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. Uh, And it's sad to think that like, you know, if you're somebody who's like, I'm, I shouldn't ask for my needs to be met. I should only rely on myself it's sad because it's like that was probably a defense mechanism. Yeah. That's probably you your needs weren't met when you were a kid and you had to try to figure out how to like navigate this very weird, scary, overwhelming world on your own. And now you've got a shell around you and you don't trust anybody because you're fucking parents. Those fucking parents. <laughs> those fuckers. Oh, those fuckers. No, no. I, I go too hard on parents sometimes and they deserve it. But uh <laughs> <laughs> I it's sad to feel like you had to like armor up 
And now you're like experiencing the world that way because you're not actually experiencing the entire world. You're not like reaping all the benefits of like really connecting. And it's also, it feels very white. Like you feel like a real white person. Like I feel like the, there's this white culture idea, individuals of just sort of like you can only rely on yourself. When if you go into like other cultures, that is not always the case and usually is the opposite of like we're, right. we're relying on the community and and it's so scary to be labeled as like codependent because we yeah, think that that's like such a bad word when really like your part your primary partner or maybe best friends or family or whatever like your primary partner maybe should be or should probably be like your primary emotional life preserver like that is the person that you're going to go to and that That you should go to and that is normal and it's totally fine and just like go ahead like just fucking go for it Uh, and so i feel like that's how a lot of like anxious attachment style folks start to kind of like spin out or spiral thinking like, oh, my anxious attachment style is so unattractive. I'm coming off as so codependent. I am way too much. I'm way too needy. I'm way too clingy. This is so unattractive. It's interesting to think that the anxious person is trying to model the avoidant person, you Mm. know, like Mm -hmm. they do it so well, they don't even care. Like, (laughs) you know, it gives. And meanwhile, the avoidant person, at least unconsciously is like, I really want love. I really want relationship, but my Mm -hmm. way of orienting towards the same insecurity is, Mm -hmm. is actually distancing myself rather than chasing it. Right. Exactly. And those, if you're an anxious attachment style person, like I have been, like I can be, I'm, you know, I can maybe qualify as somebody who's secure, but if I'm triggered, I'm going to go ahead and like skew towards anxiety. Yeah. Same. Yeah. Um, we are the glue that's keeping these fucking relationships together, right? <laughs> if, if it wasn't for us, if it wasn't for our anxiety and hypervigilance and hypersensitivity and focusing on all the things that may go wrong, we would fucking float away. Like if you see like two avoidants that are together, they there's no glue. They float away. That's I mean, it so can work, funny. but it's- They're friends know. with benefits usually. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Anxious babes are super cute. I love them and what they do for relationships all over the world. I don't want you to feel ashamed. And like you're saying, the avoidance, it's easy for us to like vilify them. These like people who are not emotionally intelligent or getting in touch with their feelings or like holding space or they need all the time in the world. Like they want a relationship just as much as those avoidance uh, or uh, just as much as an anxious person. So like we have to remember that they want to be in relationship just as much as the next person. Yeah, it, the interesting pattern change that has to occur there, you know, as opposed it's like you stop chasing them as an anxious person and you give them the space to come towards mm-hmm. which really I think the pickup books do say something like that, but <laughs> they tell you to <laughs> oh, insult yeah. them on the way, of course. Yeah, exactly. But, yeah, it's it's an interesting dance. I'm curious in relationship because this seems to come up a lot or it doesn't get spoken about a lot. And I don't think I've ever actually even talked about it on the podcast. I'm curious, what happens when you're in a relationship and you're sort of, we talked about this being a stupid meme. You know, I was saying that, you know, like uh, someone who really loves you would never mm. catch vibes for someone else. It's like, well, it is human to find other people attractive. Like, you're not shutting that off. And if you pretend, like, there's no one else as beautiful as you. <laughs> and you can mean that from, like, a genuine place. Don't I mean, get me wrong, if you're dating you're me, about, then yes. Right. Like, you're correct. I <laughs> right. Mean, I get it. <laughs> Do you see what I'm saying, though? Yeah, like, yeah. it's like, you say that and you, obviously, you can mean that. Like, I, there's no one else I find more wonderful, more beautiful, more loving, blah, blah. And then, mm-hmm. you know you see some total sexy person walk by Mm -hmm. and you have your sunglasses on that are reflective (laughs) or you forget that day. And then you're like, uh, how does a couple navigate or how does a person actually navigate Mm -hmm. when they are experienced crushing on someone else? Mm -hmm. Because I would imagine for a lot of people don't share that they are because they experience such shame Mm -hmm. from even that because in our, I mean, religion, culture, mm-hmm. how it's all sort of toxically taught us that this the monogamous lens is the only, and if you have eyes, you're, you're mm-hmm. not going to go to heaven either. Like, you got to go to hell now. Mm-hmm. I mean, there's so many. Yeah, so long <laughs> question. 
I hope that makes sense. Oh, it makes perfect sense. And it's it's the thing that usually, whenever I post about this on TikTok, um, I get a lot of hate, a lot of comments of like, you don't know what you're talking about. And, and a lot of those videos are like, okay, five things you should do if you start crushing on somebody else or if you find somebody else attractive outside of your relationship. This is how you can handle it. And I'm just sort of like presenting like, here's something you can do. Here's something you can think about. So that's sort of like, look how normal this is. And they're just mad at the idea. They're mad at the idea because of the message. And I think that I usually like. That's your fault. That's your fault. (laughs) That's Therapy fault. Jeff's fault. We we figured it <laughs> out. Fault, yeah. Someone go troll him now. <laughs> oh, you don't need to hop on the bandwagon. There's plenty of trolls. It's <laughs> yeah. fine. Yeah, I got my inbox is filled. Yeah, yeah. Uh, my those videos usually like get picked up by like the Bible side of TikTok, Oof. where there's like a real like they there's like they read the Bible to me about how like you can't have eyes for anybody else and you're sinning or this is like you, you should only be in love with your person and not be attracted to anybody like else. Christ right just yeah, like Christ like yeah. JC <laughs> like our boy Jesus he was just like only into who's he into I don't think he ever had sex and his mom was a virgin so it's all solved exactly immaculate conception yeah yeah you gotta you have to have like these immaculate eyes just for your only for your for your partner and if you don't then you're like there's something very wrong with you and that signifies that there's something very wrong with the relationship or that it's over (sighs) um so there's a lot of fear and it doesn't toxic it's very toxic and it doesn't allow you to be like a full person and like you're saying when you get in relationship you don't magically stop being attracted to anybody else so i usually encourage people to enjoy it like how fun is it to be like super attracted to somebody else like uh think about it imagine it it's totally fine and if you want like i would love it if you could talk to your partner about it of like do you see how hot that guy is do you see how hot she is like and you like talk about like how attractive they are and It's like it's it's a nice, really secure feeling that you can have. And if you want, there can be like little feelings of jealousy or insecurity pop up, and that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. As a couple, yeah, you can navigate it as a couple, and that's okay. Um, One thing that I do want you to like, well, we'll get into like some red flags in just a second. But first, uh, one of the things that it, it can tell you about the relationship is like if you're really attracted to somebody who's like really spontaneous or wild or somebody who's like um, can like have really deep emotional conversations that might be a clue as to like what you're needing and wanting in your current relationship. Yeah. So it's like, yeah. So, Oh, I'm interested and attracted to this person and they have these qualities. I can just like maybe explore those qualities in my relationship or do more of that with my current partner. So it just sort of like acts as signals. I'm like, oh, this is what I like, and can I experience this in my current relationship? Um, so ask yourself what it means, and see if you can see if you can like insert it into the relationship that you're in. You know what I mean? Yeah, I think of how a lot of infidelity in workplaces, for example, which I think it's something like seventy percent of affairs occur mm-hmm. with someone you work with. Mm-hmm. How often what occurs is you know, we have needs that aren't getting met in our relationship. There's things that aren't happening. Mm -hmm. You know, we're hanging out with this person from work. Mm -hmm. We don't have all the history. We don't have all the shit, the baggage, Mm -hmm. the things that aren't being discussed. It's so much easier Mm -hmm. to just, oh, I'll just get my needs met here. Mm -hmm. And we never give our partner a chance. We're getting our emotional needs met there. Mm -hmm. I love how you're saying when you don't villainize it or Mm -hmm. vilify it Mm -hmm. and shame it, it actually can serve as an incredible piece of information Mm -hmm. as to what you actually need. And if you're proactive about it can actually develop in your relationship. Like it can be an incredible resource. That's such a different flip of Mm -hmm. it. Yeah. It can be an incredible resource. And, and like you're saying, if there is any thoughts of cheating or infidelity, it, it oftentimes is that thing of like, Oh, if I hooked up with this person, it's not that it's not even so much about the person, but it's about like the the you that you get to experience, the part of you mm. that you feel like is missing in your relationship. You imagine that you'd be able to experience it with this new person. And like the number one fucking thing that people say when like couples come in and there's been infidelity and somebody's like, oh, but you know, 
I hooked up with this other person and I felt alive. And this part of me, like I got to experience the number one thing that the other person says who got cheated on is like, why couldn't you, I give that to you. Why right. couldn't you bring that into the relationship with me? Like I could, we could be really adventurous. We could like add more novelty. I could like get a sex swing. We can like go on vacations, <laughs> whatever it fucking is that you want to do. Like, I can provide that for you. And actually that sounds like really hot or really interesting, or you know what, this is how I can feel more alive with you. Like it can like strengthen the relationship or take the relationship to the next level. And if you just start at the very beginning of like, Ooh, that person is hot. It can be like a fun little playful thing of like, Oh, I wonder if I can introduce this thing into my relationship. So let's not freak out about it. Yeah. That something about that novelty. Hey, oh, like yeah. bringing in adventure, bringing in, because it seems like relationships over time, when they become complacent in terms of intimacy, when they're not doing the things that they used to do, because it feels like often, you know, I think it's Esther Perel who talks about how love needs closeness and safety and, and mm-hmm. uh, desire needs distance and mystery. Mm-hmm. And, and those seem to be at odds. And I was like, well, I don't really feel like they're at odds. I feel like in a relationship, like it, it sounds like they are because Mm long-term relationships are this more closeness. But what I really find kills intimacy in relationship is that we lose ourselves, our sovereignty, our identity, not the hyper individualism, but the actual individual, the dreams of self, Mm -hmm. the interests of self. And so I think then we unconsciously see our partner as the reason we mm-hmm. forgot about ourselves, mm-hmm. you know, because what's hotter, you know, I think about that from an intimacy perspective. It's like, when do we stop chowing down on each other? Like, why all of a sudden <laughs> is it like, like, I remember getting my hair cut. This was years ago. I mean, this must be 15 years ago. Mm-hmm. And when I had more hair to cut and I remember the, the, so it was like another woman getting her hair cut. And she said, uh, yeah, I just got married. And the other woman's like, well, I guess like you'll know, you don't have to give any blowjobs anymore. Oh. And I was like, oh, hey, <laughs> over here. Like I have, I have something to say. Uh-huh. Uh, yeah, you do. Like <laughs> there's something about this like long-term commitment that says mm-hmm. I no longer have to try. And I think that's actually the failure of the containers of long-term relationship oh, yeah. is that they, we think the agreement is, this, it actually in that way becomes a sentence. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And it's like, well, I don't know why they cheated. Mm-hmm. It's like, well, you left the relationship without leaving it. Mm-hmm. You know, it's, mm-hmm. we always vil- vilify or I'm using the wrong words. Villainize. I villainize or vilifying. Yeah. Well, whatever. Sorry. Either way, <laughs> fuck the person who cheated, right? That's how we, we think about <laughs> exactly. it. And, you know, I, when I talk about it on Instagram, I'll say like, the cheater isn't always the villain, you mm-hmm. know, like we co-create these and often I'm not talking about you know, for clarity, gray area, everybody. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Not talking about narcissists, serial right, cheaters. Right, right. Yes. Talking about regular humans in relationship that have needs that aren't being met. And mm-hmm. is it wrong to cheat? Of course. But what is the underlying information that's coming? Yeah, exactly. At, at first, it's hard. Like, you can't get there usually at first because there's so much pain and betrayal yeah. and upset and anger. Like, everything is all fucked up. The bond is no longer there. Like, can yeah. you trust this person ever again? There's so much, like, pain and grief and shit that you the have to, The like, deepest pain. Oh, yeah. It's, 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 like, legit traumatic. Like, it's... it's- palatable it, it'll fuck you up definitely yeah uh, so there's that but then eventually when you can kind of like get through that which could take a while there's a really interesting conversation to have of like what is the system how was this set up how did you both kind of like contribute it and i'm also like all these caveats, you know, like we're saying, like, I'm not, I don't want to victim blame the person who got right. cheated on. Like, it's not like, cause ideally the person who did the cheating should have said something before they did the cheat. A hundred percent. Right. Like maybe fucking speak up. Like you're being kind of a coward. I'm going to empathize with you. I don't, I, I, but also like maybe say something. The problem with like when a couple comes in and someone's like, I cheated and I'm like, okay, why? Why'd you cheat? Or how did that happen? They'll be like, oh, I have no fucking idea. I don't even know. Right. Who knows? I don't know. And it was just... Saturday and <laughs> I fell in love with them at work. Yeah. <laughs> it's like the story comes out. Uh-huh. But the problem with that 
type of answer is that like if you say like i don't even know i was a different person who knows how that happens like you're not taking any accountability right you first need to take accountability for us to like eventually get to a place where you can like really apologize and we can dig in to like understand how you both contributed um but so so there's there's that uh and also cheating sometimes I feel like the number one reason people will cheat is because they have the opportunity, which doesn't mm. sound great. <laughs> uh, so a lot of times like cheating is just like in order to like stay faithful, it's just like it's saying no, because a lot of times you're not like seeking the cheat. You're like being presented with it, with the opportunity. Yeah. And you need to say no. You need to say no, because like you're going to like fuck up a bunch of shit. You're going to make your partner really sad. You have to do these mental gymnastics of somehow being OK with it or allowing it to happen. It's a whole fucking journey. Um, anyways. I don't know. I, I always have a lot to say about cheating because I think it's like a really interesting, fascinating subject. But I do agree with you that when it comes down to it, how are you both contributing to the system that sort of like allowed this to happen? Yeah, there's a lot to learn there, especially in the part of apologizing and then atoning. Because mm -hmm. the amount of deposits you have to put in to rebuild the mm -hmm. trust and actually mm -hmm. recreate the foundation. But, you know, that idea that the former relationship dies and a new one is born. Mm -hmm. But we learn from the former one. We're not saying, you know, you just sweep it. Oh, that's sweet. Yeah, that guy, I didn't even know who he was anyways. I really appreciate. Let's just, you know, and it, you hear some people say like, oh, you never let it go. Mm. And it's like, I get that. But I also is like, is there an opportunity to atone? Like, I, mm -hmm. I know that was hard. Mm -hmm. I think when it gets weaponized is the hard part when there's a sourcing of power over time. Mm -hmm. Again, mm -hmm. so many nuances to this. Uh, there's so many For nuances. you listening, we want to explore all the nuances. We're not blaming anybody. <laughs> I am curious, what are the red flags in the crushing? Because you said you were going to talk about yeah, this. Yeah, yeah, the red flags. Because I feel like we're, we slipped into where the red flags go. <laughs> exactly. So if we back up a little bit. It's a red flag if the person that you're crushing on or that you like have attraction for, it's a red flag if you want to confide in them before you want to confide in your partner. Right. Because now it's just that's like, good. oh, God, now that relationship feels more special. That's yeah. a word. And a lot of times you don't even notice that you're doing this because you're just like so excited to like confide. And, you know, that's a red flag. Another red flag is that you're sharing unflattering details about your current partner with mm. the person that you have a crush on. Bad look. Not that a good sign. Good. Yeah. Um, another one is that you're. You're starting to see your crush in a more positive light than your partner. Another one is that you go out of your way to create opportunities to be around your crush or the person. It's not just some like passing attraction with the barista or something. You're like getting five coffees a day. It's fucking yeah. obvious. Man, Cynthia, I don't know. I'm just, I'm addicted <laughs> yeah, to you. Exactly. Yeah. Um, also, if you're feeling just like less engaged with your relationship, that's a red flag. And another big one is just... If you asked yourself, if your if you ask yourself, like if your partner was doing these same things and you were really upset, that's a red flag. So Ooh, that's a big one. Yeah, that's a big one. It's hard to admit. I remember to someone saying to me as a qualifier for like what cheating is, mm -hmm. would you be comfortable behaving the way you are in front of your partner? Mm -hmm. I think like I didn't think of this when I was younger, you know, the idea that my relationship itself is sacred. Mm -hmm. And every behavior around my relationship must preserve and have reverence for it in the sacred nature that it is. Mm -hmm. I don't think we're taught that, you know, like it's no. think of like what we're taught through. It. I mean, there was a whole, you know, I was thinking as we were talking about the impact of culture and society and colonization and everything that impacts the way we relate religion. Mm -hmm. There's so much to undo, you know, there's so much to like, pull out and i mean this is really the work but you know i think if we can return to the sacred i, I was listening to richard Rohr mm -hmm. not long ago and he's uh, he's a priest i believe mm -hmm. and he was saying that the journey for the true god is the same as the journey for the true self like if you go on the journey to find god you'll find yourself and if you go on the mm -hmm. journey to find yourself you'll find god mm -hmm. and i thought what a beautiful truth like that's been my experience not god in the catholic sense but mm -hmm. just connectedness mm -hmm. and i think when you 
recognize yourself as sacred, you recognize partnership as sacred and you recognize the earth as sacred. Like everything comes back. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm curious your thoughts on that. It's, yeah, you need to like experience everything as relational. Like you are connected to everything the you know, nature, animals, your partners, family, friends, community, even the people you fucking hate, even those shitty parents that let you down so long ago. Uh, if you think relationally, if you think as long as you're not like a you and me and instead you're like an us and you're understanding like the effect that you have on your partner or on anybody, uh, things can go much more smoothly because you're really stepping into like the humanity and you're, you're, you're connecting with like the empathy and you'll be much more lovely and attractive. People will want to be around you more often and you want to be around other people. But when you start to like wall off and do your own thing, it's most likely, like I've been saying, because you are hurt because you're armoring up because you've been, you've gone through pain and you've gone through trauma and, and it's really easy to like, hate those people get really frustrated with those people you know discard those people but if you can have compassion for them then that can kind of like allow them to feel safe and secure and open up as well so yeah i mean i agree with all the stuff you're saying uh and if you can like navigate this world in a way where you're like thinking about the impact that you're having like we said before like we so often think about like our intention and other people's behavior if you can flip that and understand what your impact is and then believe that people have good intentions, then, you know, everything can, can feel a lot better. Acknowledge your own red flags. I never <laughs> thought of that. That's a good one. Uh, that yeah. brings humility into the relating process. And mm -hmm. I think one of the most core uh, mm -hmm. qualities of a really great partnership is, is having humility for the feedback you receive. Yeah. And if you don't know what your red flags are, I'm not going to be mad at you, but I, I understand like how we like really need to see ourselves as good people. I get it. We all think we're fucking great. Um, <laughs> and if you, but if you don't know, Oh my God, I bet there are so many people out there that would be, I can't wait to fucking tell you. So like ask your partner, ask your exes, or ask like your best friends to be really fucking honest with you. Like go mm. ahead and ask the community that you're closest with to tell you what your red flags are. They'll probably, I don't know if your exes are going to be nice about it, but your best friends in your community <laughs> might be nice about it. And you get some of the most valuable fucking information that Amen. you've ever had. And if you're currently dating or trying to find a partner, that shit is gold. Like you're going, you can like change, you can, fully understand how you're interacting and impacting people. Oh my God, that is such good information. You know, oh, it just makes you so much better at relating, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, and I love how you said to bring everything back to being relational. Like you were speaking earlier about how if someone's anxious and wondering about how to get their needs met mm -hmm. or get reassurance, mm -hmm. they're not thinking relationally if they're silencing themselves, they're not thinking what contributes to the other person's experience of me and what, you know, mm -hmm. I love that. Um, this has been amazing. I can't wait to have you back on because okay. I feel like we could jam on all the subjects. Uh -huh. And um, where can people find more of you? Obviously on TikTok, TikTok <laughs> at Therapy Jeff and, and Instagram. And where Instagram, else? yeah. And also I've been start. I've been doing a lot of stuff on Patreon. <clears throat> so if you go to Patreon and you look up Therapy Jeff, you can get all this fucking wisdom that I'm giving you all for free right now. Right on. <laughs> uh, but you can pay just $4 a month. Um, and I'm on Patreon way too much. I'm posting multiple times a day these sort of like long, 10 minute long like uh, opinions on like, because I do the one minute thing on TikTok and Instagram. And then I follow it up with like a 10 minute uh, vent session <laughs> or deep dive. Like on, deeper dive. Yeah, on Patreon. And also like all the, all my patrons on Patreon, they're the ones that are like influencing all the content that I create. So if you feel like you want to influence what I'm creating, then find me on Patreon at Therapy Jeff. Awesome. And you also have websites. 
Yeah, you can go to therapyjeff.com if you just like want to stare at my beautiful picture. Uh, you can go to therapyden.com if you want to find a therapist. That's a national therapist directory. Um, very progressive search filters. Uh, you can find therapists that are sex positive, body positive, work with open and poly relationships. You can search for therapists based on their sexual orientation, their gender, their ethnicity, the language they wow. speak. And if you're a therapist, you can sign up for free. It's just a free therapist listing site for anybody who wants to sign up and um yeah so therapy den therapy jeff patreon tiktok and instagram Mm -hmm. well thanks so much jeff i really appreciate your time yeah yeah i had fun thanks thanks so much for tuning in to today's episode if this episode resonated with you one of the best ways to support the show is to go subscribe to the podcast so you don't miss any more leave a five-star review on apple podcasts or wherever you listen to it or share the episode with your community on Instagram or whatever social place you like to hang out. This helps get it into more people's ears, and I'm so grateful for your support, always. Thanks again for tuning in. Much love.